Aloha Kako, and welcome to our live from Noir, at, Noir Lab at Gemini event. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. If you're here in Hilo or later in the evening, if you are joining us from one of our um, one of our other facilities, um, this afternoon I will be happily presenting to you our host and our science guest. But first, uh, a little bit of background about me. My name is Jamika and I am privileged to be one of the outreach assistants here at the International Gemini Observatory here in Hilo, Hawaii. Today, I will be joined by two amazing guests. First is our host and his name is Peter Michaud. Peter leads the communications, education, and engagement team for the Gemini Observatory as part of NSF's National Optical Infrared Astronomy Research Laboratory, NORLAB. He's worked at Gemini for over 20 years, and before that, he taught astronomy and planetariums from the East Coast all the way to Honolulu. He will be joined by our special staff guest scientist, Andre Nicola Chene. Andre obtained his PhD in astrophysics from the Université de Montréal. He worked as a research associate in Victoria, Canada, then as a postdoctoral fellow in Chile for a few years before joining the Gemini Observatory in early 2013. His main scientific interests are massive stars and young stellar open clusters. So before we move over to Peter, just a few housekeeping notes. So we are on YouTube Live and this is uh, our first go through. So we are very much appreciative of your patience and understanding um, as we go through this. Now, of course, we are excited for your participation. So even as Peter and Andre are speaking, please feel free to go ahead and put your questions in the YouTube live chat. We do have another staff, Alyssa Grace, uh, monitoring the chat so that all of your questions will be forwarded from there to us, to the host and uh, our science guest, Andre, so that they can answer them. Peter will take questions at the end, but feel free to keep those questions coming. Additionally, there is a bit of lag time that can range from five to 10 seconds to maybe a little bit longer. So if you are having some issues with uh, speech catching up, please accept our apologies on the front end as we are learning how to best use this technology. And without further ado, I'd like to go ahead and move to our host, Peter Michaud. Thank you, Jamika, and aloha, everybody joining us. Uh, we're from, again, here in Hilo, Hawaii, at uh, the Gemini North. Normally, we do this program from our headquarters uh, here in, in Hilo, but uh, with social distancing, we're trying something a little different today, so we appreciate you uh, helping us with this uh, experiment to see how this works. Um, normally, we be doing this with a classroom of students uh, or a group of, of, of students that uh, we've been working with uh, to, to uh, share what we do at the observatory. So I'm going to switch over to my screen sharing mode. And let's see here, move my windows around a little bit. And we'll start off by taking a look at a few slides and uh, videos um, to give you a bit of an overview of uh, the Gemini Observatory, how things operate, uh, talk a little bit about some of the science that we do and some of the exciting results and um, uh, technologies that we use as well. So um, I'm gonna start with a little video, time-lapse video that shows the Gemini North Telescope up on Mauna Kea here in Hawaii um, at night. And so you can see the stars in this time-lapse moving over um, as the dome points to different places in the sky, the Milky Way just, oops, and now we're jumping over to the inside view. And to just give you a, a sort of a sense of the scale of this, the telescope itself is about seven stories high. Um, and 
and uh, you can see it tracking along. Uh, the sky is blue here. This is nighttime, but the moon is up. And um, if your eyes were sensitive, sensitive enough, you'd be able to see the blue sky at night as well uh, by moonlight. Uh, but in the camera here is sensitive enough to show the color of the sky at night. Uh, the moon's about to set. It was a full moon. So as soon as the moon sets, the sun rises. That's what happens when the moon's full. Um, now we're going to just take a look at one more quick video here. We'll talk a little bit more about this later, but this is showing Mauna Kea, which is the tallest mountain on the planet if you're measuring from the uh, sea floor. Uh, when you look at Mauna Kea, you're looking at it, uh, you can imagine it's about waist deep in the ocean. About half of it is showing on the top, the other half is down underwater. So it's a big mountain, uh, about 14,000 feet from sea level. And you can see uh, as night uh, approaches, um, the stars are gonna come out. Uh, and again, the moon is lighting up the sky here too. And so you can see that, uh, uh, you can see the clouds and, and uh, whatnot. We'll talk a little bit more about this later. So I'm gonna move on. Uh, I just wanna say a little bit about the Gemini Observatory. We have twin eight meter telescopes, which means the mirror that collects the starlight is eight meters across. It collects an awful lot of starlight that way. Um, and we have two telescopes. One of them is in Hawaii in the Northern hemisphere, about 20 degrees north latitude, and the other in Chile, somewhere down around 30 degrees south latitude, so that we can see the entire sky from the two telescopes. Um, we're coming from Gemini North, which is in Hawaii, and here's a nice uh, satellite view on a rare day when all of the islands are essentially clear. Um, we're located on the Big Island, which is the one down in the lower right. I'm uh, gonna zoom in on the Big Island and take a look at a few features here. Uh, you can see those two big white uh, caps in the middle of the, uh, not in the middle, but on top and bottom of the island. Uh, that's Mauna Kea on the top and Mauna Loa uh, down below on the lower part of this image. And the white is snow. And we'll talk a little bit more about the uh, weather and the environment on Mauna Kea as well. The other feature you can see in this image that's kind of interesting is over towards the right uh, side of the island, you see a sort of a red glow there. I'm not sure how good the resolution is on YouTube, but if you look carefully, you can see um, that that was actually taken a few years ago uh, when lava was flowing uh, from Kilauea. And uh, you may recall that uh, there was uh, about a year and a half ago, uh, we had uh, quite a lot of uh, other volcanic activity. We'll talk a little bit more about uh, the geology here on the Big Island as well, just to give you a sense of uh, um, sort of a perspective on where we're located here. Uh, this is our headquarters in, uh, in, in Hilo. Uh, we get a lot of rain in Hilo and that's why we like pictures with rainbows. Um, you can see that we're an international partnership by the flags out in front of the building. Um, at this time, nobody's in the building because of social distancing. Uh, we've closed the building and uh, we're keeping it uh, clean and, and ready to reoccupy hopefully fairly soon. But our control room is there as well. And so uh, at this time, we're not operational on the sky. We're looking at ways that we might be able to get back on the sky. But when we do operate, we operate remotely from a control room in Hilo. Uh, and at night, there's nobody on the mountain. During the day, typically we'll have a day crew up there that will be doing Doing work on the telescope, um, you know, up to a dozen or so people that will be maintaining everything. Uh, but they are also not going up the mountain right now to work on the telescope. Um, quick video here, just to, uh, by the way, this is not to scale in case there was any question about that. Uh, the two Gemini telescopes in Chile and Hawaii, both sides of the equator, that allows us to see um, the entire celestial sphere. Uh, overhead. So we can see the northern sky, the southern sky, and collectively the two telescopes can access any point in the sky, which is a very powerful capability for an observatory to be able to see the entire sky. There's also some overlap. So there are objects that we can see with both telescopes. However, we very, very rarely would try to observe the same object with the same telescopes, uh, unless there was some event that was happening that was changing very quickly. And we wanted to use the time zones to our advantage so we could see uh, the object over an extended period of time, but that's uh, not something we do on a, on a regular basis. Um, of course, we have two telescopes. We're going to be focusing on the one here at Gemini North uh, here in Hawaii, but this is Gemini South in Chile. Uh, you can see it's a, a 
beautiful, beautiful location there and the beautiful skies. Uh, I will point out that the night this picture was taken, it did clear up and we had beautiful uh, skies that night. It's not usually cloudy. Um, and we don't like to show pictures of our observatories with clouds in the sky, but uh, this was an exception. Um, speaking of clouds, I wanna talk a little bit about the um, the weather and uh, the environment here in Hawaii. This is Mauna Kea looking at it from Mauna Loa, looking over uh, during the day. Uh, this is a sequence uh, for of an entire day. Uh, I took pictures about every 30 seconds and you can see what's called the inversion layer. See how the clouds come to a certain level and then level out and tend not to go any higher than that. That's one of the things that makes Mauna Kea such a great place for astronomy is very rarely do the clouds get up to the top of the mountain and obscure our view. Uh, it's one of the reasons that here in Hilo, we get a lot of rain. Hilo's off to the right in this image here. So the clouds build up over us, dump all the rain on us and keep it clear up on the mountain most of the time. Hilo gets Oh, depending on where you are, about 150 inches of rain a year. So uh, we're a very wet place. Um, and it's fortunate because it's one of the reasons the top of Mauna Kea is so dry and such a great place for reviewing the, the universe. Um, there are some other features of Hawaii that, that uh, people are quite familiar with. And one of them is uh, the, the volcanoes. Uh, the the Big Island is one of the most volcanically active places on the planet. And um, <clears throat> here you can see some of the eruptions of Kilauea. Um, if people often ask, um, well, if we have all those volcanoes, aren't we worried that uh, Mauna Kea might erupt? Uh, because all of the mountains here in Hawaii are volcanic in nature. Um, it's been, geologists say, about 4,500 years since there's been volcanic activity um, on Mauna Kea. So we feel pretty confident and pretty safe on Mauna Kea. However, it's a long dormant volcano, it's not extinct. And so someday it will probably become active again. Uh, Mauna Loa, um, on the other side of, of, the, of the island, um, has been active in recent times. In fact, in 1984, there was a flow that got within about five miles of Hilo. You can see the glow from Hilo. Uh, so um, in Kilauea, as we all know, was active just over a year ago and was very active and caused lots of destruction. Over 700 homes were destroyed from that eruption. So um, it is a, uh, a very real aspect of our um, our, our location and one of the risks that, that, we, that we do run. Um, another feature of Mauna Kea is the weather. Um, you know, most of the time it's very nice, especially during the summertime, it will be nice for weeks and weeks on end and we'll get uh, um, just pristine conditions for studying the universe. But in the winter time, typically we'll get two, maybe three big snowstorms come through and we can get um, um, drifts of snow uh, with, 10, 15 feet deep, and we may be closed for a few days. Uh, staff will have to go up and shovel the snow off the dome so we can open the dome and observe. Because oftentimes after these big storms, we get some of the best conditions for observing, dry, very clear uh, weather conditions. And so we want to get back on the sky as soon as possible. We have to get all this snow out of the way. And yes, we, there are snow plows in Hawaii um, and we use them up on Mauna Kea. So, but, about the only place we use snow, snow plows. Haleakala on Maui can also get snow um, as well and Mauna Loa as well, but uh, Mauna Kea kind of takes the cake for the most extreme weather uh, in Hawaii. This is a weather tower here showing uh, uh, a process called rime ice, which is when you're in a cloud and it's freezing and the wind is blowing and ice builds up on one side of a structure and sort of grows, goes out horizontally. Um, you don't want to be standing under this when the snow when the sun comes out and, and melts this ice and it starts falling off this uh, this tower because it can be hundreds of pounds of ice up there coming down. Uh, so pretty dramatic weather sometimes, uh, very dramatic. But then um, from down below. Um, you have a tropical envi tropical environment, and uh, it's quite a contrast between the snow on the mountain and the tropical weather down below. Uh, in fact, there's um, some one of the things that that people do is try to surf in the morning, and and there's actually been people skiing on the mountain. Although we try to discourage that because uh, it's not a an appropriate use of the mountain to be skiing on the mountain. Uh, and this is what it looks like at night as uh, we open up to observe the sky. Um, 
And uh, Andre Nikolai actually, I think, was going to say a little bit more now about uh, what happens uh, when the sun goes down and we start getting ready to observe the sky. Yes, I'd like to share that uh, part of the day with everybody, essentially, because that's a great illustration of how all that awesome piece of equipment has to work together, as well as an awesome piece of staff having to prepare so many things so we can open the dome at the end of the day and be ready for exploring even more, uh, doing science that is only possible with eight meter telescopes. So during the day, um, there's a, a team that works on all the pieces, making sure that everything is at the right temperature, everything is uh, working properly, moving properly. And the dome itself is uh, acclimatized for the forecast temperature when the, the night will start. So that means that when it's time to open, uh, we can open everything all at the same time. And now the temperature inside the dome is already pretty close to the one outside, yet we like to open when the sun uh, is, is leaving, is almost uh, gone at the horizon. So we have about another hour for everything to smooth out, all the differences in temperature that might remain. And, and then everything uh, must run. So in that time we have before we, we start the actual nighttime observation, so before the sun sets and when the night is uh, dark enough, we, uh, we have an opportunity for uh, calibrating all the instruments, making sure that everything is in focus, making sure that uh, we'll get the sharpest image when it's uh, the first, uh, when, when we catch the first four times of the night. And the challenge after that is to use all the usable time of the night efficient, efficiently so we can achieve as many observations as we can until the sun comes back again. Okay, thanks, Andre Nikolai. Appreciate that. Um, the other thing that happens um, at this time of the day when the sun goes down and the vent gates open up and the observing slit opens up is that it often gets very cold. <laughs> and uh, the people uh, controlling the telescope, like I said, are in Hilo. Uh, and so all of this is done remotely. And we have a lot of remote sensors that are keeping track of the environment, the humidity, the um, uh, cloud cover, all of those sorts of things. So that if the weather goes bad, uh, we can rapidly close things up. Uh, if, the, if the humidity, for example, gets above 80%, we close everything up because we don't want water vapor condensing on any of the optical elements. Uh, it'll uh, they, they do not uh, appreciate that uh, <laughs> and will, uh, um, bad things can happen if, if there's too much humidity or too much wind even too. If the wind picks up and starts buffeting the telescope at a certain point, we have to close things down. Um, it's not uncommon at least once, maybe sometimes twice a year for us to get winds over a hundred miles an hour on the mountain. Andre Nikolai, did you wanna add something there? I see your face. No. Oh, no, I'm good. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Okay, so uh, let's move on and let's take a look at the uh, telescope here from outside. This is kind of a trick photograph that we took um, where we took multiple digital pictures uh, as the dome was rotating and then stacked them on top of each other so it looks like the dome disappears. And so you can see the back of the dome, but you can see the telescope in front and what the telescope looks like compared to the size of the dome. Um, with the Milky Way up overhead. Uh, so we've seen what the telescope looks like as it's making observations. Let's take a look at some of the types of things that we look at. And this is my absolute favorite um, photograph uh, that, that Gemini has taken. This is an infrared image of Saturn with its moon Titan down below at about, oh, seven o'clock, 6.30, 7 o'clock position down there. And using a special technology called adaptive optics, uh, we can essentially zoom in and see Titan, in this case, in exceptional detail. Um, what we're looking at here is the atmosphere of Titan. And that bright spot you see there is a storm in the clouds of Titan. Uh, so we can see weather on a moon of another planet using this technology. It's called adaptive optics. And I want to talk a little bit more about adaptive optics. Um, when you first hear of adopt adaptive optics, it sounds very complicated. It's really not that complicated. I'm going to attempt to explain how adaptive optics works uh, in the next five minutes. So 
We'll start with this rather simplistic view of starlight or light from space coming into the atmosphere. Um, when light is emitted from an object in space, uh, typically there's essentially nothing that will interfere or cause any distortions to that starlight. Um, the space telescope being above most of the Earth's atmosphere sees this light and you get these basically parallel rays of light, um, waves of light coming into the Earth's atmosphere. And that's why observing from space is so powerful because the light is not distorted by the Earth's atmosphere. As soon as those light waves enter the Earth's atmosphere, the air itself has different densities because it's different temperatures. Warm air is less dense than cold air and it's mixing together. And um, if, you know, when you fly in an airplane, you feel that. Uh, basically, it tur is turbulence that you feel in the atmosphere. Well, that turbulence also distorts starlight and disrupts and bends that wave front, as it's called, of light. And by the time it gets to the telescope, it can be fairly distorted. That's also what causes the stars to twinkle. So the twinkling starlight is very romantic, uh, but to astronomers, they hate it because uh, it, it distorts our view. It makes, it makes the view blurry, basically. And so that's something that astronomers struggle with when observing from the ground is the turbulence and the distortion caused by the atmosphere. So we have a way of addressing that, and it's called adaptive optics. Uh, adaptive optics actually started as a military technology where the military wanted to fire lasers up through the atmosphere, going the other way, uh, looking out, and the atmosphere would distort it and cause the beam to spread out and not do any damage. And so um, they developed a technology that allowed the beam to stay very tightly focused and, and be uh, be adjusted so that the atmospheric turbulence wouldn't spread it apart. Well, when that became declassified and, and computers became more powerful and could do that uh, routinely, astronomers adapted this technology for, um, again, what we call adaptive optics. And here's how it works. It actually uses a laser as well in this case. A couple of ways you can do adaptive optics with natural guide stars or with laser guide stars or both. And we're going to show you how we make artificial stars in the sky to use this technology. The joke I used to make is that, or like to make, is that uh, there's not enough stars in the sky for astronomers, so they have to make their own. And so for adaptive optics to work, you need to have a point source of light quite close to the object you want to study to use as a point of reference. So let's go up and take a look at how this works. We're gonna propagate the laser into the sky. And so the laser is gonna go through what are called relay optics on the side of the telescope. You'll see it here in a moment. There we go. It's gonna to go to the launch telescope on the top of the telescope, shine up into the sky about 90 kilometers up there is a layer of sodium. That sodium was deposited by meteors in the atmosphere. Well, that, this is a sodium laser and the sodium light excites the sodium atoms in the atmosphere about 90 kilometers up and causes it to glow. From our perspective back on the earth, looking at that, we see a point of light. We don't see the column of light because we're looking at the column straight on, right? So we're gonna go back now to the telescope and follow that beam down that that artificial star that we created up there in the sky. By the way, that star is bright enough to see with a small telescope, but you won't see it with the naked eye or even a good pair of binoculars. That light is focused by the telescope and it goes down here into our adaptive optics module. Okay, this is our instrument cluster. And one of the instruments on there is the adaptive optics module. What it's gonna do basically is process the light so that then we can study it and um, um, get incredibly sharp images of objects in space. So we're gonna cut away the adaptive optics. Here comes that really slow moving light. It goes through a, a collimator, a deformable mirror, a beam splitter is the third thing. And then it comes, the red light comes over onto a detector and it goes to the computer and we have an image of a star that looks awful. It's just twinkling and shimmering all over the place because we haven't turned on the adaptive optics yet. So the light comes through the collimator over on the left and it's gonna hit a deformable mirror, a mirror that changes its shape about a thousand times per second. It's not doing it yet because the light comes down here to something on the bottom called a wavefront sensor. It figures out the shape on those wavefronts and tells that mirror to take that same shape, but half the amplitude. 
so that when those wave fronts hit that mirror, they're flattened like potato, from potato chips to flat wafers. And then some of the light, the infrared light in this case, goes over here. Now that focuses on the detector and look what happens to the star image. It goes from blurry and shimmering and going all over the place to a nice crisp image. And we can get, oh, about a tenfold increase in resolution by using that technology. And we can get to the theoretical limit of an eight meter telescope, which allows us to outresolve uh, even the Hubble Space Telescope. The Hubble Space Telescope is a relatively small telescope compared to Gemini. Um, Andre Nicolai is what, 2.4 meters across, I think. Um, and we're eight meters across. So we can collect more light. And with this technology, we can, we can sharpen that light light. Um, you know, there are limits to it. It's over a relatively small field of view, and it's at certain wavelengths of light that we can do this. But using this technology, we can do some pretty amazing things. This is what it looks like. This is uh, an image that um, Joy Pollard took at Gemini over the course of a whole night. You can see over on the left, the sun is setting. Over on the right, the sun is rising. Way over on the left, you see that streak of light over there on the left, that streak of light, that's the moon setting. And then over the course of the night, you can see how the laser has, has uh, traced paths across the sky as it, as it tracks along with objects in the sky. And you can tell this is Gemini North. Um, I'm sorry, we can't be a little more in interactive here on this, but uh, you can s uh, because the, the North Star is, is right there in the middle. Um, making a very small arc in the sky. The North Star is about a half a degree from being directly over the Earth's North Pole, but you can see all the circumpolar stars circling around the North Star due to the Earth's rotation. So um, let's talk a little bit more about some, type, some of the types of things that we see with adaptive optics. This is a wide view, what you see, might see with the naked eye of the constellation of Orion. Those three stars in a row you may recognize as, as, as the Orion's belt. Down below that is a star forming region called the Orion Nebula or Nebula or M42. Let's zoom in a little bit. It's right there. We'll zoom in a little bit more. And through a through a, a, you can see the Orion Nebula, Nebula with a naked eye. You can see it with binoculars. A small telescope will show you an amazing view of the Orion Nebula. We're going to zoom in though with Gemini a lot. Okay, so let's keep going here. Um, and we're gonna take a look at a, a section of the Orion Nebula. And you can see in this image here, you see the entire Orion Nebula up in the upper left. We zoom into the nebula there. We zoom in one more time uh, to this field right here, which we call the Orion Bullets. What's happening down in the left there is that you have uh, a star forming region where very massive, uh, what are called O-type stars are being formed. Andre Nikolai is a specialist in that uh, field. He studies massive stars. And so uh, maybe Andre Nikolai, if you wanted to say a little bit maybe about what we're looking at here as we zoom in even more on what are, what are called the Orion bullets. Absolutely, so that's a very amazing uh, image there because Orion is the nearest uh, star forming, young star forming area from us. So for us, it's a great opportunity for really getting all the details of what's happening uh, in that precise moment when we have massive stars being formed. And um, so in, in that area, you have a lot of very massive stars. They, they could be 20, 30, 40 times the mass of our own sun. And when a star gets that massive as it forms and even later in its life, uh, it loses a lot of mass in the form of winds. And those winds are very powerful. It's not just uh, the wind like the one we experience here on Earth. It's not even the, the, the solar winds that you may have heard of. It's much more powerful and much more um, uh, charged with, uh, with particles. So everything around those stars have to cope with it. So uh, what you're seeing here is the effect of those wind basically just uh, catching those clumps of denser matter where other stars are being formed and those clumps being just surviving this intensive wind from many, many massive stars. So that's, there's a lot of dynamic, there's a lot of chemistry happening there. Uh, those are very exciting areas that uh, many people like to study for different reasons. Uh, understanding um, the formation of the massive stars, uh, their parameters, if they have magnetic fields, if they, if they start spinning on themselves very fast when they're young, and all those uh, questions that have a huge impact on our, on our understanding of, of the life of the most massive stars in the universe. Okay, thank you, Andre Nikolai. And I, 
ironically, my, my wind chime is, is going, um, going off here uh, as you were talking about those stellar winds. Um, not, 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 that's not happening because of the stellar winds, by the way. So <laughs> um, let's just take a quick look at some of the other recent findings from Gemini. By the way, all of the images that we're showing you here are available on our image gallery at gemini.edu uh, and go to our image gallery and you can find all of these, these images there, um, uh, the videos as well. Um, okay, this is kind of a, a, a compelling looking image. Uh, it's very colorful. Uh, what's of interest, though, is the really boring small little dot at the very center. <laughs> and uh, it's, you may have seen some stories on this. It was uh, nicknamed uh, the mini moon because it's the second known object other than our big moon known to uh, be in, a, in an orbit like, like um, our moon is around the Earth. And actually by now, um, or actually, I think it's early May, this object will have escaped the Earth's uh, uh, orbit and will be, will be flying away from the Earth. But that little spot right there is only a couple meters across, a really small object uh, that um, was discovered and we followed up with it on Gemini. The reason the stars are so colorful in there, or the, 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 those lights are so colorful, is those are stars. And this is a color picture of this object. But we had to, in order to get a color picture of an object with a, with a telescope like Gemini, you have to take three different photos with three different uh, different filters, a red, green, and a blue filter, basically. And so when we combined it together, um, because they were taken at different times and this object is moving in the sky, it looks like the stars are moving, but it's really because this object was moving relative to the stars as we took those three images of this object to put it together into a color picture. Um, and you can see the object itself doesn't look all that colorful. Um, the stars do because they were they're separated and they're not all stacked on top of each other, but because this object, all of those colors were stacked on top of each other. And uh, that's what it looks like uh, when we do that. So. You know, this was an object that um, was discovered and we had to follow up very quickly because it was fading very quickly. And so what the astronomer did was to put in what's called a, um, a request for a director discretionary time. And so our director got the request to see this and we rearranged the schedule so that we could get the telescope on this target and get that data quickly before it was no longer available. It's something called time domain astronomy, which is a, um, oh, it's a, it's a um, very important, uh, important part of modern astronomy these days is following up on these objects that are changing very rapidly. And another recent uh, finding, which is quite uh, compelling, is of, of an object called a quasar. Quasars are very distant objects from the very early universe. And um, quasars are basically early galaxies with huge black holes in their cores that are glowing um, very brightly um, due to the, the black holes, which is the source of energy. And in this particular quasar, the astronomers were able to measure the velocity of those winds around that black hole um, uh, from that material. And they measured the most energetic winds ever uh, detected around a quasar. They're, the winds are moving at about 13% the speed of light. Um, and while they're not the fastest winds, they're the, the, the wind, this material has the most material there. So they have more energy uh, because of the amount of material that is being uh, accelerated to those incredible velocities. And so um, it's the highest energy wind quasar we've ever, ever detected. And this is artwork, by the way. This is not; uh, these are not actual images from the telescope. Um, the image, the, the data that they were using would be spectroscopic data, where they take the light and spread it into a rainbow of colors, and from that you can determine velocities of, of gas and objects in space. Anything you want to add, Andre Nikolai, as as the expert on these sorts of things? Well, I think you've covered it very accurately. Um, so if we compare those winds to the ones I mentioned before, this is uh, like by many factors, about, like many orders, like, and I, I don't know if it's like a thousand times more, more powerful, but it's, uh, it's, in, it's in that range. Uh, you don't want to get any, anywhere near those uh, black holes. 
Sounds like a sounds like a Star Trek episode, doesn't it? Pretty much. Okay. <laughs> um, and also, um, we like to take pretty pictures too. And this is an image that was obtained with Gemini of something called the planetary nebula. This is a, a fairly compelling planetary nebula. Some planetary nebulas just look like donuts in the sky. Others have all these different shapes. But essentially, a planetary nebula like this represents the end state of a star of, of mass, uh, stars of mass very similar to our sun. And so we think in about four, four and a half billion years from now, our sun could end up in a similar state to this. Uh, basically, it will expel its outer layers into space and um, become just an ember of its former self. Again, we've got, you know, four, four and a half billion years before this happens, no need to worry. But by studying objects like this, we are studying um, the fate of stars like our sun um, in billions of years. And finally, the last pretty picture I want to show you is an image that we took of two interacting galaxies. Galaxies tend to form in clusters. And oftentimes these clusters of galaxies, the galaxies in the cluster will interact with each other uh, as they're moving through space. In fact, if you've ever seen the Andromeda galaxy uh, in our sky, it's about, I think, 2.6 um, million light years away. And, and oh, I can't, I can't remember the number. Andre Nicolay, do you, you don't happen to remember the, how long it will be before the Milky Way and the Andromeda galaxy interact? I think it's something like two billion or two, two and a half billion years, but that's- Yeah, it's a long ways off. <laughs> but these interactions, take millions of years to transpire. So it's like the, these, these galaxies are, are doing these graceful dances. And as they do that, they kind of tear each other apart gravitationally. Uh, but when, when galaxies collide and interact, it's not like you know throwing um, a, a rock against a wall or something like, they're not solid objects. Galaxies are mostly empty space. The distance between our sun and the nearest star is um, 4.3 light years, or um, I think about 26 trillion miles or something like that, some, some incredible distance. Uh, so the galaxies really kind of pass through each other. Uh, the analogy, is if you stand with a friend over a few feet away and you take two handfuls of sand and throw them at each other, most of the sand particles will, or will, will kind of miss each other and just pass through each other. That's like galaxies. The stars don't collide together, but the gravity distorts them and causes these beautiful intricate patterns over millions of years to form and evolve. Um, and we can simulate that on computers and show what, what these forms might look like um, in these dances. But the timescales are so long that we can't watch it unfold on human timescales. So we can just sort of get a snapshot of what that interaction looks like right now. Uh, and this is a, a great example of two galaxies interacting. And one of the things that happens when galaxies collide is you get um, disruptions in the gas that causes, could cause stars to, to form. And that's what those red those red uh, glow and glowing globs are, are places where, where stars are forming in those galaxies, uh, sparked by the, this, this gravitational interaction of these two galaxies. So, okay, I'm going to turn this back over. Oops, Andre Nikolai, you have some slides, don't you? That you wanted yes. to show. So I'm uh, gonna stop sharing my slides. Yeah, and I will start sharing mine. So let me just first click. Uh, okay, I'm sharing mine, then present. So as it slowly gets to presenting mode, um, is it going? Yeah, there we go. So you've heard it before. I'm interested into uh, massive stars and also uh, very young star clusters. So um, let me uh, take the time to let you know what I mean by young star clusters. So here you could see an image, uh, you can see an image of a uh, young uh, kindergartner uh, class here. Uh, they are pretty similar to the uh, group of stars I'm studying in that sense that um, when, when, when you see a picture like that, uh, you can really guess that they were all born more or less at the same time. So they all have the same age. Uh, would that be a public school? That means they are most of them from the same area. So they, they all come from, from the same place. 
And if you see differences in between, uh, be between them, uh, that comes from another reason than the age and where they come from. And that's, that's very precious for us astrophysicists to uh, have some uh, certain values so you can work on those you don't know very well. So um, if I compare that group of young kids to the group of young kids I'm studying, uh, so that's a young star cluster, what you're seeing here is uh, the cluster called NGC uh, 6520. But you see more than that. All the yellow uh, uh, stars in that picture are not from the cluster. They are background stars because uh, when we look towards this uh, cluster, we see a lot of stars that are also in a galaxy, but much further away. The ones that are from the cluster, you may recognize them very quickly. They are uh, forming that kind of uh, uh, crown of blue stars around a yellow one. So that's what forms that group of stars. Uh, we, uh, we know that they are fairly young. Actually, they are, um, in, in that case, they are uh, 150 million uh, year old. So I would say they're almost in high school uh, at that age. Uh, to be very young, you would have to be a few million year old. That's like very, very young. You have to think that uh, it takes about a million to sometimes even 5 million years for a star to form. So uh, when it's in the first million years of life, it's very, very young. Um, and um, so most of them are blue, but in the, right in the center, there's a big bright yellow star right there. And if they are uh, the same age, and if they are at the same place, uh, that tells us that there must be another reason for them to be different. Um, and in that case, what happens is that the one star in the center was born with more mass and that means that at the moment we uh, observe it, so when we take that picture, it's already in the process of getting towards the end of its life, while the others are still shining blue, showing that they're still in the very earlier stage of their, of their life. So by seeing uh, groups like that, we ended up realizing that the, the total mass of a star at its birth uh, corresponds pretty directly to the duration of its life. So the more massive the star, the shorter its life will be. Um, and okay, we study like, in that case, that one cluster, NGC uh, 6520. That's interesting. We can find a lot of things. We can study a lot of things. Orion that we mentioned earlier is another area where we all the stars are the same age and in the same place, we can study the same way. But once we have, many of them, then there's even more we can do. Um, by knowing that they have the same age and they are in the same place, we can, for instance, uh, find their, the distance between us and them. And that is very precious because here I'm showing a picture of uh, the Milky Way. The Milky Way is the galaxy we live in. And I'm pointing with an arrow where we are. So uh, somewhere around the sun. How do we know uh, that our galaxy looks like that, because this is not an actual picture. It cannot be an actual picture unless you live on another galaxy like M31, where someone, if there is anyone there with a telescope, can, could take a picture of us looking like that. But we don't have this privilege of looking at our own galaxy from outside. How can we know it looks like that? Well, the, the trick is to is to measure the distance to different types of object in our Milky Way. And once we find them, we can trace them. So that would be, for instance, uh, an illustration of all the groups, all the star clusters that we know about, and we know the distance more or less about. And then uh, by tracing where they are grouped and where they are, and, and, and we can eventually then trace where the spirals are and where the star forming regions are. If we combine with uh, that with other informations, then we can have a full picture of how our own galaxy looks like. And one thing I'm working on right now with a few friends from across the world is uh, one of the latest Gemini discovery that we're about to uh, send for publication in the month to come, which is another cluster that is uh, even beyond where this arrow is pointing. So basically, um, most of the cluster we know about are pretty close to us. And the reason for that is because we have to look through our own galaxy. So there's a lot of dust and there's a lot of material in the way uh, acting a bit like a fog would do. We can hardly see through a fog. And the further, the harder it is to see. 
but there's uh, one cluster that seems to be very young and, and very bright that we were lucky enough to spot all across our own galaxy after looking through the whole thing through the center and through even on the other side of, of the Milky Way. And uh, the interest in studying such an object is that it gives us information on a part of the galaxy that we know very little of. Uh, this big part here, which is in the center, is very, very, very dense, and it's really, really hard to see through it. So this illustration shows you arms going that way, but it's um, really what we can deduce from the little information we have about this area, because most of that here is almost terra incognita. So having access to a cluster on the other side with a determined distance and determined population, and uh, eventually we may even be able to find what kind of uh, uh, composition, chemical composition there is there, we'll be able to uh, probe for the first time what's happening on the other side of our galaxy at the level of uh, stellar population and stellar forming history. Which is interesting because we can assume that if it happens here, it happens there, but the only way to know for sure is to see it. So that's a great opportunity for us. So that's in a nutshell what is uh, occupying my mind for most of my time. Um, now I will shift gear. Um, I want just to make sure that you know that we're uh, using um, this very uh, challenging times of confinement and social distancing. Uh, well, for helping out those that may uh, appreciate uh, the gist is to share the designs of our card game. Uh, so for those who don't know, uh, we've been printing cards uh, and they play in a game that is very specific. It's a unique game uh, coming from Gemini. And to make sure more people have access to it, if they need to find something to do over their weekends, um, uh, we, uh, we're sharing the, the cards for printing. So if you go on this URL, uh, you will find a place where it says download your own deck. Um, so it's a, it's a collective game. Um, up to four people work together over a semester to uh, observe and make Gemini work. Uh, the goal is to observe as many programs as we can. So programs are cards that look like this and we observe the, those beautiful objects. This is featuring uh, many of the amazing pictures we can take with, uh, with Gemini and uh, we use uh, Gemini instrumentation and, and we have to go by the weather conditions. All the rules are also in, the, in, in that website. Uh, you go just in Launder, you have um, the rule book. And of course, there's a, a contact information if you have any questions about the game. Um, I will stop sharing just to show what I did here. Um, so you can print, you know, about six. Ah, I need to also stop <laughs> my background, looks like. Otherwise, you won't see a thing. Um, it will take me. 10 seconds, if you bear with me. Thank you very much. Here we go. So what I'm doing here, I'm showing uh, six cards if you fit to printable area and you can uh, cut them to the right size for uh, plain card sleeves if you, have, if you already have those. So you can just, uh, it doesn't have to be perfect. Once you cut them just so it fits in, then uh, you can have uh, playable cards. The recipe for how many cards to print and everything is on the website. Um, I'm using some that have a colored back. Uh, there are different types of cards. If you, if you can make different backs with paper to distinguish different types of cards. So um, all the recipes is described on the site. Uh, I hope you can uh, enjoy the, the game if you didn't have the chance to have your own deck already in, in hands. Uh, we'll continue to distribute the full, de the full cards um, as well and we'll we're, we're in the process of producing new designs as well, but uh, at least for now, everybody has access to the basic deck of 90 cards, uh, 90 cards to play the game and learn how we operate Gemini in a fun way. Great. Thank you, Andre Nikolai. And also, um, not to get ahead of ourselves, but um, you're looking at um, making a digital version of that in the sense that you can play online too, right? Um, for the future, so stay tuned. Sure. There are many people offering uh, some help to uh, transfer everything on a, on a numeric platform. Um, I'm very, I know very little about that, those tools, but um, with the proper support, it should be doable. I don't know when, but uh, that's definitely. Uh, but for now, the, the, the printable version is available. And uh, also there's a video that uh, uh, will help to uh, 
instru with instructions. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I think at this point we're running a little bit over. However, I'm, I'm willing to stay as long as people want to stay online for if there are any questions. Um, and um, we'll open it up to, to questions if there are any. Well, I'd like to first thank Dale and Harriet Dupuy uh, commenting from Louisiana. Thanks for watching and thanks for your nice words. And we won't keep you up too much later because it's almost 10 o'clock there, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> So Dupuis, Michaud, Chenet, a lot of French names here. <laughs> <laughs> Alyssa, did we have any questions um, from YouTube? There are no questions right now. I'm sorry? There are no questions right now. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> Peter, I have a question. Yes. So can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay. So I noticed when you were talking about the telescope and you were talking about how, uh, how we do all of our observations from HILO, um, you, did, you didn't mention also that there are special times when it can be run uh, from the telescope up at the summit as we used to do. Okay, good point. Yeah, that, that um, you know, we can run the telescope from the summit if we if we need to, and there are special some observations that uh, do require that were that were there, but it's 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 very very rare. Yeah. Um, also, and you probably would expect this from me, but uh, well, first off, I'd like to say the part that you did on the adaptive optics was most awesome, but I didn't see I. I wanted to see my laser shooting out of the telescope. We got some really great pictures from the south. We, we, you know, we haven't utilized it very much here in the last couple of years, but I know there's some super pictures of, of going on sky with the laser. Okay. Yeah. Let, let, yeah. Sure. Let's uh, take a look at what uh, what we can add. So I. I, I was pretty charged about this. This was a this was a great uh, way of uh, sharing Gemini. That's that's my feedback. <laughs> okay, thanks, Jeff. Okay, so we have some questions from YouTube now. Sunny Walker wants to know: In the photo of the stellar bullets, was that matter shedding from the stars or just background nebula? Um, that was actually being shed from the uh, formation process of the stars uh, as winds coming off uh, th those areas where the stars were forming. And actually, um, if you recall the picture, I, actually, I can just go back and share that again. Um, one thing that we didn't talk about there that's kind of interesting. Um, let's see if I can bring that up. Can you see that, uh, that slide again? Um, those, um, there is a way to make a tracer uh, annotate. Let me, let, oh, wait a minute, Let's see if I can get that to work. I don't see my mouse, but okay, I can't, it's weird because in this mode, I can't see my mouse, so I can't select um, the right cursor and all. So I don't even know where my mouse is right now. Oh, there it is. Bear with me here a moment and I'll, I'll get there. Okay, I still don't see see anything on there. Anyway, um, if you if you look at these pillars that are going off towards the right, um, at the very tip of them, you see sort of some blue clouds up there. That's actually where there's iron in the cloud itself. And what's happening is that material in those clouds with the iron in it is being accelerated to such a velocity that it's causing the neutral hydrogen to glow, the hydrogen that's in that area that normally wouldn't glow. Um, but as it's excited by these clouds passing through, it causes it to glow. And that's what you see as these sort of pillars come going off uh, to, the, to the left from those blue, those blue spots at the top. Uh, so it's kind of like a tracer on a bullet. 
Uh, and what's happening though, is that cloud passing through the hydrogen excites the hydrogen, causes it to glow. And that's why we see that glowing pillar behind it because that cloud is, is, is being um, propelled uh, through that neutral hydrogen gas. Okay, so we have more questions coming in on YouTube. Uh, Stargazer Girl 30 wants to know how are observing objects chosen? Uh, that's a good question. Um, it's, a, it's a lengthy process in time and it involves a lot of uh, people in the, in the community. So when a big telescope like Gemini is, uh, is built, it's with the goal of observing as many um, sort of um, objects and getting as many data that will make progress in science as possible. Uh, and, and focusing on those that are really depending on the size of the mirror. And, and, and so we're having an, an eight meter telescope. This is something that can do a, a lot of unique type of observations. So how do we select the targets? Well, it's not us to decide. Um, it's for people to having ideas. So anyone who has an idea of something they'd really like to study in, in depth, thanks to the size of the big telescope, they uh, fill a form that is uh, made available to them and they send that over to us. And once we, uh, before a given deadline, once we gather all the proposals, all the requests all together, they are distributed uh, in the community and different experts will um, evaluate the value of the project. Some projects are clearly, you know, very necessary to, uh, to, to, to schedule because we know that this will answer a question that we really need an answer for. Uh, those uh, that are really um, com compelling, but sometimes may miss some details, just need to be reworked and, and, and proposed again. So with that process, we select a certain number of programs that uh, are worth pushing over to the observatory. And once we have them, we, we uh, prepare them uh, in the system. And then we decide which one to observe, which one to observe and when. So uh, the, the selection of merit is done. Now we're at the observatory. Uh, it's a given, uh, a given day. We have to decide what to do over the night. We go by deciding if the weather will comply. So we look at the um, uh, predictions and we uh, try to um, plan for the most likely night. We also plan for other type of weather, but we focus on the one that is the most likely. Then we go for the objects that are available at that night because uh, there are some targets that are more visible in the spring, in the summer, winter, and so on and so forth. Um, and then um, we go with uh, the type of instrument that we have available. Some type of observation requires a certain instrument, but that instrument is not under telescope yet. So we have to wait until it is available. So there is a, a suite of um, things to consider. So our goal, is to grab at the observatory is to grab those programs that were selected as the highest priority from our peers and give them the maximum chance to being observed at the telescope and to use as much of the night time as we can use in the most efficient way. Thanks, Andre. Next question, also from Stargazer Girl 30. What objects can Gemini see in the infrared that opti optical telescopes can't see? Um, that's excellent. So let's focus on those objects that are mostly for infrared. Well, why would an, an object be visible in infrared and not in optical? There, there's a variety of reasons. One is, well, because it does uh, shine light in infrared and not so much in optical. So an example would be uh, a star that is very, very small and, and not so massive. We call that substellar mass type of star. And those are brown dwarfs. They, they, um, we call them brown dwarfs. Uh, they, 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 they have more or less the shape and, uh, and the color of Jupiter, sometimes a little, more, a little more maroon. They tend to be much redder and sometimes so red that you really want to observe them in infrared because this is where you will get the most light uh, compared to uh, optical where they're, they're not shining that much of the blue light, especially if they're far away. There are other reasons. Some objects uh, would normally have blue light, but they are behind uh, a cloud of dust. 
and the dust acts on the on the light by uh, blocking the by blocking the light, but it's blocking much more of the blue light than it is blocking of the red light. So the bluer the light, uh, the smaller the wavelength of the light. For those that are familiar with the term, so it's like if the size of the grain is big enough for blocking uh, the light. And as the light gets redder, the wavelength gets bigger. And then it, as if the light could go around the dust and, go, and shine through the dust. So there are many extreme uh, cases when the dust is so dense and, and, and there's so much gas in between us and the object we're observing that we can only observe that in infrared and not so much in optical. You can actually observe that phenomena when you watch the sunset, because as the sun goes down, it's going through a thicker layer of the atmosphere and there's more dust in the way. And so the red light can come through and you see the sun looking redder because, it, because that light can pass through that gas and dust the same way the infrared light, even further into the red, um, can pass through the clouds of gas and dust that are obscuring it and at other types, other colors of light. Okay, thank you. We have a question from Ebony Marshall. It says, is the upkeep of sensitive equipment still happening while we all practice social distancing? Ah, yes and no. Um, yes and no in the sense that we are um, putting maintenance to the minimum, uh, essentially because we do not want to be in, uh, in a place when we have to urge people to go to the telescope and would uh, the, the spread of the virus be a big threat uh, to the staff sending a group of even five people to go together in a confined place is not optimal. So to avoid having to send people to the summit uh, at, at all costs, we don't want too many systems to run at the same time to minimize the risk of having one of them failing. Uh, so, um, in the south, uh, so in Chile, they have decided to put everything to rest, completely to rest, uh, with a very minimum use of energy and minimum equipment running. In the north, we can afford having at least our instruments cold, but uh, not with, with no big moving parts or nothing really happening. Uh, the reason why we do that is because uh, if we have to go on sky quick, then uh, we would be ready uh, in Chile they would have to spend some days to put everything down to the right temperature and run. So it's a very minor difference because in both cases, um, we're just uh, making sure that we run to the minimum and, uh, and to minimum, minimize the risk of having to do any maintenance. So it's almost as if you were at rest, but we're completely alive, we're just dormant. I can just add a few details for those who may not be familiar. Uh, the instruments on a telescope like Gemini, we have multiple instruments uh, ready, ready to go uh, at any time. And so they need to be kept cold with cryogenics um, and in vacuums um, and uh, need to be maintained at that level. Once you warm them up, it becomes a lot more difficult to then cool them back down again. Um, and so we, and we do have sensors that are monitoring them as well. Um, but uh, um, yeah, the, normally I think, and what the question was, was getting at was that these instruments are very sensitive and they also require that they stay within certain conditions in terms of temperature and pressures and things like that. So um, yes, that is a, a, a very big concern. That's it for the questions on YouTube Live. We have a comment here saying that if, the, if it was not of the dust in our galaxy, the center of our galaxy would outshine the full moon. Uh, so this phenomenon of the dust blocking light um, is shaping the sky that we see at night. If it was not of it, the sky would look completely different. Uh, in the same manner, we could say we could invert the problem and say if our eyes were seeing things different, uh, uh, nothing would look like what we see. So uh, if our eyes were not seeing the optical light, so from blue to red, uh, if, if our eyes were not able to see the colors of the rainbow as we see them, if they were seeing in radio waves, for instance, uh, everything, all the galaxies would look like a big continuous uh, stripe of lights all connected or, or 
uh, some some stars would look pretty dim, while some things that we barely see, we can barely see now would be super bright. Uh, if you were seeing in other type of lights, the, the, the whole world would look different. Um, it just happens that we can only understand the universe from the from our viewpoint with our limitations, but uh, that doesn't stop us. <laughs> Okay, sounds sounds like a good place to stop if we're out of questions. And uh, thank you everybody for joining us and uh, we'll be continuing these programs. Uh, watch on social media for the, uh, I think we'll do the next one next Thursday at the same time. Um, and um, be safe. Take care, everybody. Hi, ho.